Good morning. I'd like to talk over with you our job of taking care of our party line customers. It's one of the most important jobs we have to do to help our party line customers get the greatest pleasure and benefit from their service. And I want to help you in every way I can to do the job successfully. Three out of every four homes in this country which have telephone service are on party lines. Nearly 11 million of our customers are party line customers. In most cases, the service is shared by folks in the same neighborhood. While our best service is the individual line, the party line is a good service, adequate for the needs of many families. As you know, the same kind of telephone is used as in furnishing an individual line service, and the same kind of line to the central office. There isn't much difference in the way calls are made, or received, or completed at the central office. Where two parties share the line, generally only the bell of the called customer rings. In many communities, this is also true where four parties share the line, although in other places, the bell of one of the other parties will ring also. Individual line service requires a separate pair of wires for each customer. In party line service, the wires are shared by two or more customers, and so service can be furnished at a lower rate. However, to get the best out of their service, the families that share a party line need to be considerate of each other, just as when they share a driveway, or as a family shares other things around the house. To get the best use out of party line service, this means, first, avoiding lengthy conversations. Long conversations keep others from using the line. Hadn't you better hang up, Peggy? Someone may want to use the line. Oh, Mom says I've got to hang up now. Bye, Susie. Second, giving up the line promptly for an emergency call. Asking for the line only in a real emergency, and then explaining why. Oh, well, with the prices the way they are nowadays, I just don't know. Can I have the line, please? I've got to call a doctor. My baby just swallowed a pin. Oh, yes, of course. All right, Jane, I'll call you later. Third, always listening to be sure the line isn't in use before making a call. Fourth, if the line is in use, not interrupting the conversation and replacing the receiver gently. Fifth, waiting a few minutes between calls to give others a chance at the line. Sixth, whenever possible, making calls when the line is least likely to be used by others, such as avoiding making calls at dinner time. Calls when housewives are doing their telephone shopping. Seventh, answering the telephone promptly. It also means thoughtfulness in such things as keeping children from playing with the telephone. Not leaving the receiver off, for this puts the whole line out of service. Answering only when the bell rings the right code. Hello? Hello? Oh, yes, surely. Because party line service is a shared service, it is all the more important that its users understand what they need to do to get full benefit from it. We in the telephone company do many things to help party line customers use their service with consideration for others on the line and to make the way easier for you to help customers overcome their party line difficulties. In different places, of course, different methods are used. Newspaper advertising, booklets, given to all new customers and to customers who tell us they have difficulty with the service, letters, envelope imprints, bill inserts, and folders. In some places, announcements on radio programs. You and the other fellow on your line can help each other to better telephone service by simply being good party line neighbors. In some places, by means of displays in the windows of our public offices. 
and posters and cards inside those offices, cards in telephone booths, exhibits in open houses, through hundreds of film showings to thousands of customers in their clubs and social organizations throughout the country. You might think sometimes that party line service was pretty poor, judging by some of the complaints you get. But don't let that lead you astray. Surveys have been made of groups of party line customers in typical communities. The large majority told us that their service was good or excellent. So it looks as though these activities have really helped people to make satisfactory use of their service. Studies of customer contacts show that less than 1% of party line users report any difficulty with the service in the average month. The small percentage of party line customers who do complain about party line service bring their problem to you, the service representative. To the customer, you are the telephone company. The customer looks to you to help solve his difficulties and improve his service. It may be simply a matter of mechanical difficulty, such as a bell that is so much out of adjustment that it rings when the other party lifts the receiver to answer a call. For example, the other party picks up his telephone every time my bell rings. The John Smith, Smith speaking. So I wish you'd do something about it. And this may be a kind of problem that is readily solved. A report to the plant department, and the trouble is quickly corrected. But most party line complaints arise from the way customers have tried to use a shared service, unknowingly or thoughtless of the fact that it is a shared service. Here's how such complaints may sound to you. I can hear the other party picking up the telephone and listening. My husband can never get me when he's delayed at the office. She tried to break in and was most unpleasant. I can't stand it any longer. You'll have to change me to another party line. Yes, some customers suggest changing to another line, thinking it would solve the problem. Of course, it's physically possible when there's a vacant spot in the terminal box. We'd need to send a man out, change the central office end of the line, and fix up all our records of the service. We'd be glad to spend this time and money if we knew it would solve the difficulty. But this is what might happen. From the frying pan into the fire. It does happen, you know. That's why we try to work out with the customers some other solution. In the extreme case where no other solution seems workable or acceptable to the customer, you would offer to discuss the case with the supervisor or manager to see what might be done to help the customer. Of course, no promise would be made unless, or until, we are sure of what we're going to do. Sometimes a customer will say, Our line is always busy. Every time we want to use the phone, someone else is on the line. I'm very sorry to hear that. And our friends are always telling us they can never reach us by phone, even though we're at home. And many of our calls are important. Well, Mrs. Albright, we've, we've simply got to have a private line. We'd be glad to do that if we could. But right now, we haven't enough facilities for people who want service. And giving one person a line by himself would be depriving others of service. And that shortage of facilities is still countrywide. It's true, in spite of our breaking all records in producing and installing equipment, not only telephones, but also central office equipment and cable, the demand still outstrips the supply. And all over the country, large numbers of people are still waiting. So all we can do is offer to put the customer on the waiting list. Too bad. Because an individual line would, of course, solve the difficulty for this customer, and the many customers who never wanted party line service in the first place, and may never really be satisfied with it. Of course, we suggest individual line service wherever we have enough facilities. But not even in pre-war days did every customer accept the suggestion. So what can we do to help our party line customer? The other day, I was in a meeting of some of your fellow representatives. They were talking over their experiences on this very subject. We find it's helpful to get a group of girls together every so often to talk out their difficulties and swap experiences. It makes sure that all of us benefit by the experience of each and every one of us. How can we be helpful? 
My own experience is that the most important thing is to be a good listener. What do you mean by that, Sue? Encouraging the customer to tell his story in his own way, so that he feels he has a full and sympathetic hearing. You see, usually the customer is upset, so you let him get his troubles off his chest. You listen and throw in a remark here and there that shows him you're interested and sympathetic. I know whenever I tell my troubles to anyone, I feel better. And my troubles look a lot smaller. Well, the customer is me on the other end of the line. I quite agree with you, Sue. I find that listening is often the most helpful thing you can do. Also, by just listening, you'll find out a lot about what really happened. Sometimes a customer will tell you more than he realizes. I once had a customer who said that... The other party kept breaking it on my call. I told him to get off the line, but he kept insisting that I give it up. Well, I was on the line first, and I wouldn't give it up. Well, that tied in with the other things he told me. It sounded to me as though the other party wanted to make an emergency call. I found out later, in talking to the other customer, that that's just what happened. What Helen is saying is that by being a good listener, we can get a lot of the facts. All this listening sounds nice, but how about the customers who just keep on telling you the same thing over and over again? We just haven't got the time for that. Yes, but you've got to give the customer time to get the whole thing off his chest. That's the help he needs most, to get calmed down to where he can look at his difficulty in a reasonable way. Maybe taking more time in the beginning saves time later. And it's worth whatever time it takes, no matter how busy you are, no matter how many times the customer tells you the same thing, or no matter how similar the complaint may seem to hundreds of others you've listened to. As Helen said, by listening we get the facts. What kind of facts do we need? First, the kind of difficulty it is. How often it happens. How long it's been going on? And what time of day the trouble occurs? One case I had was a newly married bride who tried to call her mother every morning. Now, this happened to be just at the time when her neighbor wanted to order all her household supplies. So at 10 every morning, whoever got the line first was good for a long time. It finally came to a verbal hair-pulling match. The bride was almost in tears when she called me. What did you do? Well, the bride was talkative and emotional, so I just listened until she told her story. Then I asked a few sympathetic questions to get her whole side of it called to the other party, gave me the rest. Well, what did you do about it? I told each party what the other's problem was. I tried to explain how they could cooperate to avoid the interference, making their calls at different times. So we have another point. Do something about it. The facts Janet got told her what to do. But can you always do something about it? Well, at least you can get in touch with the other parties, call them or write them. And you can make sure the complaining party understands the limitations of the service itself.
How do you do that without making him think that you're not sympathetic to his side? Well, one way is to ask him if I should get in touch with the other parties. Then I explain what I might say. In that way, I get my point across without making the complaining one think I think he's at fault. That's one way of doing it. The main thing is to let the customer feel that you are really sympathetic and interested and trying to help him. And to assure him that something can and will be done about it. Because there is always something we can do. Whether we send a letter or a booklet to all the parties on the line or take some other action. May I speak a piece? Why, yes. This is just applying good overtones of service to party line complaints. The way we do and say things is just as important as what we do and say. That's just as true in party line complaints as anything else. To begin with, you've got to show you're personally interested in the customer's problem. He must feel that you appreciate his point of view. You can do that only when you give individual attention to the customer's case. Be considerate. That's what counts. Don't let him feel you're handling it as a routine case. If you're sincerely anxious to be of help, you'll reflect that to the customer, and he'll see that you're doing everything that is practical to help him in his difficulty. There's one thing that we haven't talked about. Following up results of our action by calling back the complaining party. We do this to show that our interest is genuine and doesn't end when the customer hangs up. What do your customers say when you call them back? The man who at first wouldn't give up the line said to me, Well, yes, maybe somewhat better now. Your call seemed to do some good. Well, I didn't expect you to call back. Thanks for helping me out. Goodbye. When I called my bride back, she was very sweet and said, It's been better. I appreciate your taking care of it. I find that almost all of them seem pleasantly surprised that we took the trouble to call them. The least they'll say is... Yes. It was nice of you to call. Well, you can't know in every case how well you've made out. But your experiences check with other service representatives throughout the system. A study of callbacks was made to complaining customers in 20 cities all over the country. Seventy-seven percent felt that the situation had improved after they had talked it out with the business office. And the proportion of repeat complaints is quite small. That's pretty good evidence, isn't it, that you can and do help? But how about the people we get whom we know we haven't helped? But how do you know you haven't helped them? Well, because they're still dissatisfied even after you've talked it out with them. Or they complain repeatedly. Those cases, and there aren't very many, you can take up with me. Arranging a callback with a customer, of course. We'll study the problem together and see what can be done to help. You can't expect full success every time, whether in handling party line complaints or in anything else you do. As in sales work, judge your job by your percentage of success. Don't be discouraged by an occasional failure. Any failure should just make us want to try to increase the percentage of success as we go along. And you generally can do something to help. If you will just, first, be a good listener. Second, get the facts. Kind of difficulty, how often, how long, time of day. And third, do something about it. If it's equipment or operating trouble, you can clear it with plant or traffic. If it isn't, we have these steps to consider. Call or write other parties. Help the customer help himself. Fourth, follow up results. Call back complaining party. And fifth, above all, show your sympathetic interest.
In spite of the highest production ever, it will be some time before we can give customers just the service that suits their needs. The kind of job you do with each complaining customer will have an important effect on how well we get through this difficult period and achieve the goal of the most satisfactory...